Good morning. I'd like for us to turn in our Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 4. Be reading uh, verses 35 through uh, 41. And I wonder, even though we've just been seated, if we wouldn't mind standing together in honor of the reading of God's holy word. Can we stand together, please? Verse 35, Mark chapter 4. And on that day when evening had come, he said to them, that is his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them, just as he was, in the boat and the other boats with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And he himself was asleep in the stern on a cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the seas, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you timid? How is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? This is God's word for God's people. Amen. Please be seated. Father, as always, we're completely dependent, and even now, ask for the assistance of your glorious Holy Spirit. You said, you promised that he would come and be the anointing that would teach us. We have this anointing, Lord. We, We invoke his presence today that he might be pleased, that you, Lord, might be pleased to open our eyes today to behold wonderful things from Your law. And for, and for many of us, Lord, we need the Spirit of God to come and turn over the soils of our hearts and to, and to plant the good seed of the Gospel, Lord, to, to weed out that um, which is choking the Word, which is stifling our growth, Lord, which is hindering us from, from pursuing You, Uh, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And I pray, Lord, this morning that You might be pleased to use this story to help each and every one of us weather our own personal storms of life. We trust You, Lord. We ask You for this and pray it together in Jesus' name. And together say, Amen. Well, this morning I want to talk to us about how to weather life's storms. We may be be facing some this morning. Uh, No doubt if we're not facing any now, we might in the future. And some of us, as I said, might be going through a storm right now. Uh, sometimes it's a, it's a time of uh, a trial, of testing and temptation. It, it, might be a, it might be an emotional storm. We might be buffeted by discouragement, overwhelmed with anxiety. There are feelings that are closing in on us and we don't know what to do about them. We might be experiencing a relational storm. Things are not going right in our personal relationships. Difficulties in our marriage, unresolved anger or bitterness towards someone who has hurt us. Might be a broken relationship with our children, a family member, our parents, someone at work. It might be be a health storm. We're struggling with some kind of chronic 
disease or pain or suffering in some way. We may get some distressing news from a doctor. I'm thinking of, um, thinking of John and Lucy. Brother, you and your wife went through a serious health storm, but you came through it. We can weather life's storms. I can remember my wife being diagnosed with breast cancer. That was our storm. It might be a financial storm. We might be swamped with unpaid bills, a loss of income, not enough money to cover our expenses. We're going into debt. Could be a spiritual storm. We're doubting. Our faith is being shaken. We're questioning our salvation. We might be under some kind of spiritual attack. We might be questioning God's sovereign care and love. Whatever we are experiencing now or will experience in the future, the storms uh, the disciples encountered on the Sea of Galilee teaches us there are lessons there that are valuable for us as we face our storms in life. And as we work our way through this passage, I want us to see primarily Jesus' glory and power and sovereignty over His creation as well as some lessons, some life lessons that teach us from the disciples' experience of how we can weather our storms. So what we need to do, first of all, is set the context. We need to go back to chapter, uh, we go to chapter 1, verse, chapter 4, verse 1, where we read there Jesus is teaching a large uh, crowd by the Sea of Galilee, uh, and because of the size of the crowd, he gets into a boat, he pushes out some distance, and continues to teach from the shore. And he continues to teach throughout the day. It's been a long day. And so we pick it up in verse 35. And when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. So why Jesus wants to travel to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, we're not told. It's possible that... that very possible that he's worn out and so are his disciples and they just need some, some rest. But what I want to see, what I want us to see, is whatever the reason, this is Jesus' desire and his will. And they're going to the other side of the lake no matter what happens on the lake. So he directs his men, they prepare the boat, and they set sail. The Sea of Galilee, we we probably already know this, but just to refresh our memory, we we know the Sea of Galilee is located in in a basin. It's about 700 feet below sea level. And it's bounded by mountains. So you can kind of picture it as a bowl, Sea of Galilee, and then these bounding mountains that surround it, and it's an ideal configuration for storms. Winds will blow into this area, and the cliffs will capture that wind, and suddenly it will whip up the lake into a violent storm, and they can happen just immediately, without warning. So when Jesus and his men set sail, the sea is calm. They're just sailing along. The boat is rocking back and forth gently. And Jesus, worn out from a day of preaching and teaching and ministering, finds a nice place in the the boat, sets his head on a probably a little pillow or something, and falls asleep. And as he sleeps, the wind begins to whip up a storm. And he is unaroused. He's still still asleep. He is so tired that he just sleeps until until it comes to the point 
that his disciples are in a panic. And this fierce gale of wind in verse 37 begins to break over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Now these are seasoned fishermen and they knew they were in serious trouble. The boat's being swamped. It's filling up with water and they realize they've been on the sea before. They've probably been in a number of storms, but not one this violent. And so they know they're in danger of sinking. So remember, they have set sail at Jesus' direction. This was His will, and that's why they're in the storm. He directed His men, we're going over to the other side of the lake. He doesn't ask them if he think, they think it's a good idea. Should we wait until morning? Didn't ask them his, their opinion. His disciples obey His will, set sail, and they find themselves in a deadly storm. There are four life lessons I want to pull from this passage. And I'll give them to you in order as we go through the text. But here's the first of our four life lessons. Number one, obedience means storms can't be avoided. Obedience means storms can't be avoided. When we strive as Christians to live an obedient, uncompromising life, we can expect hardship, tribulation, and there will be times of bad weather. Commenting on this passage, Martin Luther said this, he said the first lesson of the gospel is that you want, if you want to be a Christian and want to have the gospel, you must anticipate rough weather, for it is inevitable. Obedience means we are going to experience storms and we cannot avoid them. It may come in the form of someone rejecting us for our faith in Christ, our family, our friends. We might be on a routine visit to the doctor, and the next thing you know, we're diagnosed with a serious illness. Sometimes storms come out of nowhere, and we get the sinking feeling that, am I going to make it through this, through this problem, through this trial? We might face the storm of our job being outsourced, a loss of income. We might get a phone call in the middle of the night from a family member and it's heartbreaking news. One moment we're living life, things are calm, and the next we're being buffeted by the winds of adversity. But that's what we can expect and what we learn from the disciples as they obeyed Jesus. Obedience means that we are going to experience storms in our life. And these storms, again, can make us feeling desperate, fearful, helpless. And this is exactly what the disciples are experiencing. One minute the sea is calm, and they're leisurely sailing along, and the next they're in the midst of a raging storm. And in verse 37, the boat is filling up. It's sinking. These are professional fishermen. They know they're in serious trouble. They know how to handle a vessel, their boat, in a storm. But this is not anything that they've ever experienced. It's fierce. It's violent. And they are so fearful, they believe they're going to die. And so they they frantically wake up Jesus. Teacher, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And I, I thought about this and I, I could almost see Jesus saying, no, sorry, man, I, I can walk on water. You know, it, I'm not worried about it. You're on your own. They know Jesus cared, but he is sleeping and they were sinking. 
parallel passage in Mark 8.25 says, They came to him, awoke him, and said, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. Luke 8.24, They came to him and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. These are seasoned fishermen, and their skills could not save them from this violent storm. And so they cry out to Jesus. They cry out to Him. And this is the second life lesson. Not only that our obedience means that we're going to experience storms, that they can't be avoided, but here's the second life lesson. Life storms teach us to cry out. They teach us to cry out to Jesus. When we feel like the waves of adversity are crashing into our little boat of life, what should we do? Pick up the phone, call a friend. We, the first thing we should do is cry out to God. That's the lesson we learn, the life lesson from from these disciples. We cry out to the Lord. We think of the psalmist when he said this in Psalm 34, 6. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Psalm 34, 7. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. Not some of them, all of them. Lord, I know You're in my boat. Lord, save me. That's what the disciples were crying out for. Lord, save us. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm drowning in a sea of trouble. I'm floundering. I'm going under. I can't, I can't take the pressure. I'm confused. I'm, 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 I'm upset. I'm overwhelmed. I'm in a panic. This is what the disciples were experiencing. The Lord is attentive to the cries of His people. That's what, that's what this story teaches us. This is what the Scripture teaches us. Here is God's promise. Believe it. Let's believe it. Let's meditate on it. Let's memorize it. Here is God's promise. Psalm 50, verse 15. You will call upon Me in the day of trouble and I will answer you, and you will glorify me. Amen? Call upon me in the day of trouble. This is exactly what the disciples do in their fear, in their desperation. They cry out to Jesus, Lord, Lord, we are perishing. Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? Well, Jesus is going to show them just how much He cares. Verse 39. And being aroused, He rebuked the wind and the sea and said, Hush, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. They awake Him, and the moment, the very moment that He commands the wind and the sea, it's like glass, just as smooth as glass. There isn't even a breeze. It's perfectly calm, and and remember the disciples were asking Him, do you not care that we are perishing? And the answer is yes. Yes, I I care, and and God cares for us in our trials, in our storms, in our tribulations, in our difficulties, in our suffering, in our pain. He cares. He cares for His church. He cares for His saints. And if He desires, and this is God's desire and His will, if He desires, He will perform a miracle to prove it. First life lesson. Obedience means storms can't be avoided. Life lesson number two. Life storms teach us to cry out to the Lord. And here's the third life lesson. 
Jesus controls storms. Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, controls storms. Jesus didn't pray and ask the Father to calm the storm. Did you, did you get that? He didn't ask the Father. He commands the seas. He orders the seas. Abraham Cooper said this. I love this quote. Quote, There is not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not say, Mine. It's all mine. It belongs to me. The psalmist writes in Psalm 89.9, You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. What does the hymn say? He's the master of the sea. Billows, what? His will obey. And yes, they do. They obey the Lord Jesus Christ because He controls storms. He is sovereign. He controls all that is in the world according to Daniel 4.35. All people, all kings, all presidents, all elections, all who rule over His creation. He controls it all. Isaiah 45, verse 15. Satan and all the angels, according to Job 1, and all the events and circumstances in our lives. One of our favorite verses, probably Romans 8.28. All things work together for what? The good. For those who are called according to God's purpose. Beloved, there are no accidents in this life. There are no accidents. Everything that happens to us has one of just two causes. Either God sent it or God allowed it. He decreed it for His glory and our good. And we remember, once Jesus calms the storms, the disciples ask, who is this that even the wind and the seas obey Him? They forgot about the storm and they're in awe of the Lord Jesus. That's the way we want to be when He calms the storms in our lives. Life lesson number one. Obedience means we cannot avoid storms. Life lesson number two. If you're taking notes, Jesus controls storms. And here's the fourth life lesson. Faith gets you through the storm. Faith gets you through the storm. After rebuking the storm, Jesus says to his men in verse 40, Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? Probably a rhetorical question. I don't think he was asked, wondering if, if they were going to give him an answer. He already knew the answer. After calming the storm, he asked them, what happened to your faith? See, for Jesus, the storm, the storm wasn't the issue. The issue was their faith. Their issue was how they reacted to this particular storm. It was their lack of faith that was the issue. He's not speaking to their feelings but to the disposition of their hearts and their faith was deficient. That's why He addressed it. And we have, we have the same challenge. In the midst of our storms, what do we tend to do? What do we tend to do? We tend to focus on the what? On the storm. That, that's, that's what we do. That's... That's our reaction. We focus on our hurts, our suffering, our troubles, our problems. But the, the Scripture is giving us an example here. It tells us in many places, we'll look at those in just a moment, to focus our faith on the Lord Jesus, on His promises, and not 
on the storm. Hebrews 12.2 The writer says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God, at the throne of God. One man put it this way, feed, feed your faith and you will starve your fears. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James writes, Consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials, knowing what? That the testing of your faith produces endurance, and that endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God is using the storms to mature our faith, not destroy it. When the disciples experienced the authority and the miraculous power of the Lord Jesus, here was their response. They became very much afraid, verse 41. Literally, it says, they feared a great fear. That's what it says literally. I, I don't know how you can fear a great fear, but that's what it says in Greek. They said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey Him? Now they're in awe. And they can't comprehend, you know, who is this man? They, they personally witnessed a man commanding nature and they just could not, they couldn't process it. Who is this man that even the wind and the sea obey him? They were amazed and they wondered. And that's a great question. And the Scripture gives the answer. Who is this? Psalm 107, verses 28 and 29. Answer that question. Answer their question. Then they cried to the Lord. I think this is maybe looking forward to what what the disciples experienced. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He brought them out of their distress. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves were hushed. In the Old Testament, calming storms on the sea is attributed to God alone. I think the main purpose of this story was to dramatically demonstrate that demonstrate Jesus divine nature that's I, I believe one of the main reasons for this storm now the in the calming of, that, that's not what the disciples could yet process but for us we recognize Jesus is God in the flesh. The disciples were never in danger of drowning. He told them before they set sail, we are going to the other side of the lake. Nothing was going to change that. This was Jesus' will. But in the midst of this storm, He demonstrated their lack of faith. The disciples cried out to Jesus, but it wasn't in faith. We want to cry out to Him in faith, but they cried out to Him in fear. The fear of drowning. And one of the vital ways we express our faith is by crying out to God in our times of need. Expressing our struggles, our dependence, our faith by asking God in our times of, of difficulty, of hurt, of trial, of temptation, of suffering, for His mighty hand of protection and guidance in our storms. And so I quickly, just by way of application, want to mention 
five aspects of crying out. Just five ways, simple ways that we are to cry out to God. And this is a theme that runs through the Scripture. Number one, if you're taking notes, five aspects of crying out. Number one, we must cry out for help in times of distress. Psalm 118.6 In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of His temple and my cry for help came before His ears. In times when we're hit by anxiety or fear or depression, whatever we may be experiencing, we cry out to God knowing that He is attentive. His ears are open to the cries of His children. We have children in our service. We're attentive to their needs. God so attends to our needs, desires to do that, that He he beseeches us to cry out to Him. Number two. In the times we feel overwhelmed with problems, with trials and difficulties, we must cry for deliverance. We must cry for deliverance. Psalm 50, verse 15. I mentioned it before and I'll mention it again. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will answer you and you will glorify me. Number three, we must cry out for healing. In Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 47, Blind Bartimaeus is sitting by the side of the road. He hears that Jesus is approaching and he begins to cry out, Jesus, Lord, have master. Have mercy on me, master. Have mercy on me. And Jesus stops. He hears the cries of blind Bartimaeus and he stops and he asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And of course, he wants to receive his sight, and Jesus, Jesus heals him. God is attentive to the cries of his people. In Luke 18, 13, Jesus tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax gatherer, both coming to God in prayer, the righteous Pharisee justifying himself before God, and then we have the contrast. We have the contrast of the humble and kind, contrite tax gatherer. He comes humbly to God. He stands some distance away, the Scripture says, and was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This This is a humble, repentant man. He's in deep anguish over his sin. This man isn't asking for pity or for help. He's pleading for God's mercy. He's pleading and asking for forgiveness. There may be someone here this morning, you are like this man, and God has made you conscious of your sin and your need of forgiveness and God's mercy. You're a sinner, as one man said, in the hands of an angry God. And this morning, you might even be in some emotional distress of it, over it. You, you might be overwhelmed with your sin. It might be washing over you. But you are aware of it, and you've come here, and God is beckoning you Cry to me for mercy, and I will hear you. I'll calm the storm in your life. I'll forgive your sin. I'll cleanse you. And this is God's promise, Psalm 86, 5. For the Lord is good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon Him. If you are an unbeliever, cry out to the Lord Jesus. Let Him calm your storms. 
Ask Him for mercy. He is ready to forgive. Let's pray. Lord, we would find ourselves this morning asking You by Your Spirit to work and bring to our hearts and our minds, Lord, that which we need to plead for Your grace and mercy in our lives. We we know, Lord, Your abundant and loving kindness. Your ears are attentive to the cries of Your children. We know, Lord, that there are There are things in our lives, Lord, that we cannot cannot navigate. We have no answers for. They have us frustrated, disappointed, depressed, anxious. Lord, we we need Your grace. We need need to be reminded, Lord, that You are able, willing, and desiring to respond to us when we will cry out to You in faith. And so we do this morning, Lord. We ask that You will contend with our hearts, that You will remind us, Lord, that though You are seated in heaven in all of Your glory and majesty, You bend Your ear. You're quick to hear the cries of Your people. And so, Lord, hear our cries. We ask You to be merciful to us. Be merciful to the one in our midst, Lord, who has not sought You who has not recognized yet, though You're contending with them this morning by Your Spirit, they have not recognized their need of a Savior and His mercy. O Lord, grant it, we pray, and grant grant it as we go through our experience, daily experiences in life, that we would be quick, Lord, to look to You to bring us through whatever we might experience as we We recognize that You are the one. You alone, Lord, are the one who will see us safely to shore. We ask these things. Pray them in Jesus' name and together say amen. Amen. Amen.